Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. It's 3 p.m. ET here in Boston, and you have found us here on Crime Time on A Mighty Blaze. I am your host, Hank Philippi Ryan, USA Today bestselling author of 13 novels of suspense going on 14. My current book is Her Perfect Life, which you see so casually displayed behind me, and my new book is called the house guest and it comes out in February. So I'll be telling you much more about that. It is sort of Gaslight meets Thelma and Louise. And that's as far as I will go about that. I'm seeing everybody come in. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everyone. If I look over here, I am looking at the comments and I welcome you all to Crime Time. Um, today we have the absolute just total joy of interviewing one of my favorite authors of all times, truly, Dervla McTiernan, who wrote this, the many books, but this one, The Murder Rule, her brand new one, is a brilliant, gorgeous legal thriller. She is coming to us from Australia, where it is, what time, Dervla? 3 a.m. It, it's 3 a.m. That is <laughs> completely crazy. So you get so many points just for being awake. You know, right, you all, we're going to just give her points for just being generally able to make us make a whole sentence. That's what we're going for right here. No promises. No promises. All right. No, no problem. It's fine. This is just us around here. And we welcome <laughs> all of you who are coming. Here's Pamela, who's saying hello to you, and Shannon Hanson, Shannon, who's saying hello to you as well. And Shannon says it's 12 noon where she is, which might be California. I don't know. We don't know. But people are coming from all over the world. And we are always, always thrilled about that. So we welcome you all. I have to say, Derla, um, and let me tell you, I started reading this. You know how you read a book and you just think, oh, okay, yeah, this is good. And by, and I start, kept reading and I kept reading and I kept reading. And at one point I just thought, well, never mind, forget about it. I'm just gonna give up the day. I don't care. I have a whole lot of work to do and I'm not gonna do it because I cannot wait <laughs> to find out what happens in this book. It is so completely riveting. I, I cannot begin to tell you. So all of you just um, go, not right now, of course, but when this interview is over, go grab The Murder Rule by Dervla McTiernan. Um, and Dervla and her publisher, William Morrow, are giving away a copy of this book as well. So leave a question or a comment in the comments. Where else would you leave them? Uh, and we will spin the wheel of fun at the end of the show to choose a winner of the murder rule. My book is called, my own book is called The Murder List. So blanket pardon for me throughout if I get the title of this wrong, but Durable's book is The Murder Rule. But uh, they're both legal thrillers. And I think we have a lot in common. We can talk about that. Let me read you before, and then I promise I'll stop talking, what Karen Slaughter had to say about this book. Gripping and full of tension with twist after unexpected twist. You won't just read the murder rule, Karen Slaughter says, you will devour it. And I did indeed. Gervilla, welcome. Uh, wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> How are you feeling about the immensely approving response to this book? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I don't know, Hank, it's so, it's so strange, isn't it? It's one of those things when people give you lovely, positive feedback, um, largely you don't believe it or I don't believe it, you know, I, I don't read reviews anymore. But when I did, if, if it was a positive review, I never really believed it. But if it was a negative review, it would kind of stick with me. Um, so I, that's mostly how I feel. I, I find it hard to believe the positives. But I will say that I happened to be on the phone with my editor when she got that email from Karen Slaughter and she read it out to me over the phone and I I got very teary and I'm not ashamed to say that because she's just a hero of mine and that she'd even read my book was a big deal and that she took the time to write that meant and I'll never forget it. It was one of those moments, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it had happened. So that was a really happy one. Yeah, it's interesting to be on the other side of the mirror a little bit to imagine Karen Slaughter reading your book is terrifying enough, but then that she would read it as as thoroughly as she did and as affectionately and admiringly as she did, and then take the time to write a blurb about it for you um, and for all of us is, is really great. Yeah, she is yeah. a hot star. That's wonderful. And I wonder about, so many of us feel exactly the same way, that if someone says something nice, we think, oh, well, no, not really true. <laughs> if they say something bad, you think, oh, I, I stink. This is terrible. Yes. And, and chew on it for days. Why do you think that is? 
we can psychoanalyze each other. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's so common to so many writers. I, I think we're just vulnerable to that stuff. It's it's hard to believe in the positives, and it's. Re I, th I don't know. Some of the some of the positive reviews get really superlative, and if a book means something to somebody, I think it really captures your heart. And I know I've felt that way many times about books that I've loved, but it's hard to imagine someone feeling that way about your book, even when it happens. There's just some part of you that doesn't, or maybe it's a self protective thing. I mean, if you went around believing everything, some everything positive people said about you, I think you'd get pretty crazy pretty quickly. So you probably do need to have that barrier up that just keeps you sensible. Maybe. Problem is the barrier doesn't seem to work against the negatives. They just manage to sneak in there, you know. I don't know. I, sometimes I like to think that that's what keeps us working hard. That's what keeps yes. us challenged. That's what keeps us always, always, always trying to do better. So yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. The, the accolades are pouring in. Shannon Hansen says, "I have Hanks the Murderless. Thank you, and I need the murder rule." And Darlene says, I love Dirtless accent, could listen to her read the phone book if we still had, <laughs> if we still had phone books. Thank you, Darlene. I really don't. And Linda Boyd says, great title. I can't wait, wait to read it. And Gail says, I, I read that Matt Damon is vacationing in Australia. <laughs> Have you seen him? Oh, yeah. I, I haven't seen him. He, apparently, he was over, over, over east, as we say, in this part of the world. So I live in Perth on the far west coast in a very, like, people say it's the remote, remotest city in the world. Whereas he was over towards Byron Bay, I think, hanging with the Hemsworths. Um, but he was in Dublin in Ireland for a while recently, and he, he endeared himself greatly to all the locals because he did all the local things. He went swimming off the 40 foot in Dullary and he did a few other cool, like local things, you know? So I think he's, he, he certainly built up his reputation in that part of the world. That's great. So you, you know him from two places where you live. That's where I am not, yes. Where you're not. Well, that, that's, where, that's where Matt Damon generally is, is where we're not. Where you, I yes, see people coming in. Here's Nancy Ash. I think that's, oh, Nancy says, I think it's common for all artists to fall short their dreams. I wonder about that. I mean, else what's a heaven for if we don't keep if we don't keep striving? Um, yes. Let me quickly say, if you have just joined us here on a Mighty Blaze, Mighty Blaze, a little tiny bit of background was started more than two years ago by the amazing powerhouse team of Jenna Blum and Caroline Levitt to keep us reading and keep us connecting and keep us communicating about books and writing. And we provide 24 seven coverage of book world on so many platforms. And we are thrilled with three dozen or so of us who are volunteering to keep a mighty blaze in the air are so pleased that you are here today and we are persevering and we're honored that you are all here today. Let me introduce to you Dervla McTiernan formally in case you don't know all the cool parts of her life. Um, Andrea is saying I'm reading her book The Ruin now and we'll get this one next to your fans are pouring in Dervla. Um, international number one bestseller Dervla McTiernan's first novels The Ruin and The Scholar were critically acclaimed around the world. Dervla has won multiple prizes, including a Ned Kelly Award, Davitt Awards, a Barry Award, and an International Thriller Writers Award, and has been shortlisted for numerous others. Dervla's third book, The Good Turn, went straight to number one in the bestseller charts, confirming her place as one of Australia's, Australia's best and most popular crime writers. She didn't write that. <laughs> this is her fourth book, The Murder Rule. Correct, this is your fourth book? The Murder yes, Rule. it is, yes. Um, and her publisher, Dervla and her publisher, as I said, are giving away a copy of this. And we will give that away on the Wheel of Fun at the end of the show. Now I will stop talking and ask <laughs> you questions, Dervla. Um, as the murder rule starts, we meet Hannah, who presents herself as a devoted, idealistic law student. And it's very clear from moment one that she's devoted but not exactly to what she says. Where did Hannah come from? Tell us a little bit about the book. Oh gosh, Hannah is, yes, exactly as you say. So at the very beginning of the book, Hannah has, um, she leaves her family home and she goes to uh, Charlottesville and she sort of cons her way onto um, the Innocence Project team there. So the Innocence Project is a small group of volunteer lawyers who work to defend people who are on death row or who can't just can't afford representation and um, people who are innocent and, and want to prove their innocence and so hannah appears to be this young idealistic law student who who is so driven to change the world but you do get the impression straight away that that's not really who she is not just because 
there are little hints through the story, but also because of the way she behaves, because of the things she's willing to do. Um, she's very definitely there for her own agenda um, and to, and she's willing to go as far as it takes to achieve that. And we, and we know from, I think, page two that she's ruthless and, mm -hmm. that will, and that she will do anything. And that we also know from page one that she has an agenda and you so gorgeously reveal throughout the book step by step by step so, so wonderfully um, what that agenda is. So the Innocence Project, as we all know, um, Allison is saying cunning yourself into the Innocence Project, wild, because <laughs> really the only reason, and we know this instantly, really the only reason you would con yourself into the Innocence Project is to prove that whoever it is, is, is actually guilty. And yes. we know that, we know that early on. Where did you get that tantalizing idea? Well, you know, I have read an article quite a few years ago about a young Irish law student who, when she was on her summer working visa in Austria, in the US, she volunteered for the Innocence Project. Now, I had been a young law student in the US on a J-1 visa, and I can tell you, I certainly didn't do anything like this young woman did. I was working as a waitress and a chambermaid in Bar Harbor and basically having a great time. But she volunteered for the Innocence Project. And when she went back to Ireland, she couldn't quite let go of the case that she'd been working. It stayed with her. So she kept working it. She kept making phone calls. And ultimately, she tracked down a retired police officer who pointed her to some evidence that had been hidden from the defense in the original case. And because of her hard work, a man who had spent more than 20 years in prison was freed. And I, I was blown away by this. You know, it was one of those stories that just wouldn't leave me because it, it struck me so powerfully what she'd been able to achieve just by her sheer grit. Um, but I didn't feel there was a story there for me to write. I, I think possibly because it felt like the story had been told already or because it had been told in other forums so well before. Um, I didn't feel I was anything for me to bring to it. And then quite a few years later, I don't know if the story just stuck with me so much that I've started looking it up again or if I stumbled across something, but either way I started reading about it again and I found out that even after she found the hidden evidence, it took another five years for the case to be heard, just because of the simple you know, the bureaucracy of these things. And at that point, he had spent more than 25 years in prison, and he only had a, a year or two left to run his original sentence. And I thought, oh, God, it's so tragic, you know? But I also thought, why is it that when I read the original articles, it was presented as such a feel-good story, with none of the dark shadows and none of the edges, just this feel-good story. And I, it occurred to me, well, maybe the editors of these newspapers in Ireland preferred the more inspirational take, or maybe, and I, this was entirely made up in my own dark head, what if the Innocence Project had you know, a PR team and they were putting out these more inspirational takes because it got more eyes on the story and therefore potentially more support for their very good work. And then I thought, well, would I blame them if that's what they were doing? I don't think I would, because I think it, you know, what they're trying to do is so difficult and they're trying to, be heard in a world that is incredibly noisy, a world that doesn't want to hear. But once I had that thought, it occurred to me, well, you know, if you are that good lawyer, you take that tiny little sidestep off that ethical straight and narrow to be more effective. Would you then take the next step? Would you then take the next step and the next step and the next step? And the idea of that sort of pulled me into the book. And then once I thought, hey, I can flip Hannah completely. What if she isn't the young idealistic law student? What if she's quite the opposite? Um, then I, it was the only thing I wanted to write, you know, I knew I was in. Oh, that's, I love that process. That is, that is completely wonderful. And you, you do have a, a, a brilliant character in the story who is exactly the example of the PR person, the PR, the, 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 I don't know, the, the, the hotshot glory boy of the Innocence Project who gets the front covers of magazines and there's all this PR about him. And Hannah begins to wonder exactly as you wondered, um, how much of this is gloss and glory and how much of this is actual justice? Mm -hmm. I, I, li I loved that character. Um, his name is Robert Parekh and he's a, he's a, a lawyer and sort of the lead of it. And Hannah is very critical of him in the beginning. He's a handsome man, you know, he's very well liked. He's sort of this Robin Hood type character, this Batman type character, you know, this, this Avenger of people. And he, he works that hard because he's a sophisticated person. He totally understands how the world works, you know, and he's very willing to play the game if it helps 
what he's trying to achieve. So he's no blue eyed boy and no innocent. And Hannah is very judgmental about that in the beginning. And she thinks, well, he's only in the here for his own self aggrandizement. That's all this is about for him. But actually, I think her view is, is she, she's lacking nuance at the beginning of the book. And I hope she kind of grows a little bit as things move forward. And I do want to talk about that um, a little bit later, because I do think that's one of the one of the essences of the book, not only the plot of the book, but Hannah's growth and her evolution and how she feels about justice and how she feels about the law, which is which is really thought provoking and really marvelous. And part of the reason that this book is so textured and layered, the title is so intriguing. Talk a little bit about what specifically that means. Well, the murder rule refers to the felony murder rule, which is a, a little piece of law that that says, look, if you are if you carry out a felony and if during the course of the felony a death occurs, you can be found guilty of murder, whether or not. And, and it's, it's, it's interpreted differently state by state, as I'm sure you would know, Hank, better than I would, I'm sure. Um, and so, you know, in some states, there are some safeguards around the law to make it more fair. But in certain states, those safeguards don't exist, and it has resulted in some very strange convictions. Um, like, for example, there was a case where a, um, a young man was at a party, and an acquaintance asked if he could borrow his, the young man's car. Now, if you believe the defense, that's all that happened. He said, yeah, sure, you can borrow my car. Um, and he went home to bed and went to sleep. Um, if you believe the prosecution, the conversation was a little bit more detailed. The person borrowing the car said, look, I'm going to use it to drive to this woman's house. She has my stuff. I want to get my stuff back. And if she's not there, I'm just going to break in and take it. So that's what the prosecution say happened. But they both agree that the young man went home and went to bed. Unfortunately, the guy who borrowed the car drove to the house. He did break in. The woman was there with a male friend. The male friend and the guy fought and the male friend was killed. So it was a murder. The person at home in bed was found guilty of felony murder and sent to prison for a long time because prosecution successfully argued he knew there would be a break in. So therefore, he was an accomplice to the break in and therefore he could be found guilty of felony murder. There's another situation where a man committed an armed robbery with a friend. Um, he was arrested. He was caught. He was arrested. He was handcuffed. He was placed in the back of the police vehicle and he was still sitting there when the, the police officer shot his friend dead. And the man in the back of the police vehicle was found guilty of felony murder. So there have been some very unusual cases where even the person found guilty of felony murder spent more time in prison than the person who actually pulled the trigger or, or used a knife or whatever method was used to kill somebody. So it's a, it's a strange piece of law. And particularly um, from my perspective as a former lawyer, I remember being in law school and the, one of the very early things we were taught is for there to be criminal responsibility or responsibility legally for an act. You must have mens rea and actus rea. You must have both carried out the act and intended to carry out the act. And then to take both of those fundamental elements away and still have criminal responsibility was very odd to me. Yes, I, it, it is a fascinating rule. And they've done away with it in Massachusetts, I think, five or six years ago. But you know, it is one of those things that you look into in your novel, you talk about this, because it's about responsibility and what and figuring what might have happened and how you how there are consequences for everything that you do when you connect with someone else and that there's a bigger picture about that mm -hmm. in this novel i mean it's not just the it's not just the murder rule when it comes to murder but it's the murder rule when it comes to our responsibility and consequences for our relationships with each other yeah i it really it seemed it, it felt like it's something that really fit the book because one of the themes, if you like, is this thing about how responsible are we for our acts? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we should be responsible for the consequences that were clearly foreseen. You know, we knew that this could happen and we did it anyway, and so we're responsible. And then there's a strong argument that we, we should be responsible for the things that we should have foreseen if we had been in any way responsible or thoughtful about our actions. And so for Hannah, she is so self-righteous at the beginning of the book. So utterly convinced that she's in the right and therefore she takes really extreme action because she's someone who you know feels very competent and feels like she's good at what she does so she thinks i'm right therefore i will take these acts i can justify almost anything and it's only later she starts to wake up and realize well i might not have been right and maybe i should have known i wasn't right and therefore you know all of these consequences that have come from what i've done i'm responsible for them and the question is is she going to be brave enough to recognize that and to 
and to make amends, you know. Which is part of the process of the book because one of the things that you, one of the themes as you, of the book is that this true belief that we believe our own truth, whatever we decide is the truth becomes the real truth. And if mm. someone else begins to believe something else or begins to show you that there may be another truth, how much we put up a palm and say, we don't want to hear that. And Hannah begins to think that about her colleagues on the Innocence Project. Don't you even want to hear the other side of the story to <laughs> understand why they, can't, why they don't want to hear the bad facts of the story, yes. why they only yeah. want to hear the good facts of the story. And in any, in any case, it is, as you say in the book, a question of the good facts versus the bad facts and who weaves a better story. Mm. And that's what you do in this book so gorgeously is that you weave two separate stories or maybe four. Talk a little bit about how you structured that and why you decided to do it that way. Oh gosh, you're so spot on. It, it, it always was about that for me. You know, Hannah, I wanted to really look at that idea that we are not good at actually, we, we think we're rational, logical human beings. Right? We, we like to think that's how our brains work, that we examine a bunch of facts and we give them, we weight them, and then we reach a conclusion. And that's how we form our points of view about the world and how the world functions. But actually, that's not really how our brains work at all, because it would be exhausting to make decisions all day long with that level of analysis. So we tend to make most of our decisions intuitively, instinctively, and because of our own inherent biases. You know, bias is a, is a bad word, but it is also just a functional word. We all function in the world with biases. And so I think I'm really fascinated by this idea that we actually don't are, are very unconscious of the degree to which we carry those biases and very unconscious of the degree to which we just seek out information that confirms them yeah. rather than information that allows us to learn. And so I really wanted to write the story in a way that Hannah is so critical of people for their that failure all the time. She's totally unaware of the degree to which she's doing it herself. Yeah. And then flip it and show that so that we can really, really see that it's always like that and that to do otherwise is actually incredibly difficult and most people can't if we are so deeply embedded in our points of view and wedded to it and and that becomes part of our identity but when we are confronted with facts that conflict with that most of us just don't see it it's not even a conscious choice not to see it we simply choose to look away or are you know, inevitably look away. And in this world, it's easier and easier to do that because we're all online and the algorithm will continue to provide us with more of the same information that reaffirms those biases. So well, it's, easier really more, it's easier and more comfortable to be right. We want to reassure that, yes. that we're right. Yes. Because if we're wrong, then the whole structure of our belief system falls apart. Falls so apart. We hold on, we hold on um, to our beliefs. And that's why your study of justice and the law in this book. I mean, this is, we're talking about, if you just arrived, The Murder Rule by Dervil Dur McTiernan. Um, your study of justice, the, the idea of what justice is, you know, that there's legal justice and there's moral justice and there's ethical justice, justice and there's relationship justice. Um, there's the justice that comes by in a courtroom and there's the justice that sort of comes in our hearts and, and minds. Ta what about that? How did you think about that for this book? I think um, for me, I remember when I was a young lawyer and I went to court for the first time and I wasn't a litigator really for most of my career. I, did, I wrote international contracts, very boring, long contracts, but I had some exposure to litigation in the early days. And I don't know if you'd agree, Hank, but I mean, I never saw any litigant come to court and walk away with a win. It didn't matter if they won. The impact of the legal system on their lives was just so destructive costs the emotional exhaustion that you know three or four years of rolling through the courts takes on somebody it was always devastating and i think this failure of the law to to really deliver what people perceive and consider to be fair and right and the disconnect between what people think it can do versus what it actually does always stayed with me you know um i i just think that systems even i mean we often read books and see movies where people uh, um defense attorneys or prosecution do something terrible truly awful and dramatic and as a result of that something terribly unfair happens but i think in practice many of the worst injustices happen just because of the nature of systems that fail um, and i wanted to look at that a little bit i mean it's it's fascinating i want to remind you all that though 
We're talking about the legal elements of the murder rule right now. This is a fascinating, riveting, page-turning thriller that's basically about a mother-daughter relationship. That is what, that's another thing that's at the core of, of this novel. Um, and it includes a, a diary, and it includes a person who reads the diary. Can you, I'm going to want to carefully toe, tiptoe around this, but what was it like to write that diary and uh, talk a little bit about how that propels the story forward? If you can, this is risky. Yeah, no, it's, it's a tricky one, but I certainly can. I mean, the diary is Laura's diary. Laura is Hannah's mother. And at the beginning of the story, you can see that they're very, very close. Um, though Laura's had a very difficult life. She's suffered some traumas. Um, she struggles with alcohol abuse and, you can also see that that's taken a toll on Hannah, but Hannah's very dedicated to her mum. And it's her mum's past trauma that is really driving a lot of Hannah's decisions today. And the way we're sort of, we learn about the trauma is we get to read Laura's diary, the diary she wrote in her early twenties, a diary that Hannah found when she was only 14 or 15 years old. And it had a massive impact on, on Hannah because it sort of explained her family, it explained why her mom was the way she was, um, what happened to her dad, all of this sort of stuff. And, and it's also, you know, quite a dramatic um, diary. It's, it's, it's about the romance of, of these early days of Laura's life. And she fell in love for the first time. And she was living by herself in Bar Harbor in Maine, working as a waitress, as a chambermaid, and just barely hanging on to, you know, a life with a roof over her head, just by the skin of her teeth. And so you kind of see, or at least I was hoping that you'd see what it would be like to find a diary like that when you're 14 or 15 years old and the impact that it would have on you. Um, and that diary is really pivotal as you go through the story. And at, at an age when you're so impressionistic, when that is mm. impressionable, I guess, impressionable, when, when your view of the world is so set and your view of your relationship with your mom is so set and your view of relationship of, of what happens to women mm. and what people do to women and the consequences to women. And it is so formative to Hannah. Was was the diary, when you started writing this, was the diary always in your mind to write? No, it's so funny. I was looking at an old draft the other day for a video and it was, there was no diary at all in the early um, chapters. I mean, I this was the thing I struggled with most in the writing of this book, getting Laura right. I had chapters from Laura's point of view where we heard her voice directly as an adult looking back on her life and talking about current life and having interactions with Hannah. Um, and that stayed in the book until really late. I just, but I always knew it wasn't working. There was just something lacking. And, and Hannah's storyline was carrying itself along very nicely, but Laura's just didn't feel, it just died on the page for me. Um, and so really late, I got the idea of the diary. And once I, I started to write. Do you remember the moment? I do, I, I just remember going into the same chapter again and again and again, and it was Laura's opening chapter. I must have rewritten it seven or eight times, um, doing it slightly differently each time, a slightly different origin story, a slightly different, you know, different length, totally, you know, reworking it, and it wasn't there. And then I can't remember what it was that just clicked. Some it's reason like, I started thinking about a diary, but it just started to work. Yeah, I mean, she because in the diary she's younger. Mm. And the diary, whatever it is, hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think this is what it was. I wanted you as the reader to have the same experience that Hannah did, because I wanted you to understand why she was pushed and what had formed her into the person she was. And then if things turned out to be not quite what they appear to be, I wanted you to have that same moment of realization so that you could judge her by those standards, I think was really the deciding factor. Are you are you all just going crazy over this now? Does this not sound like the best book in the world? I promise you, it really is right up there among the best books in the world. Let me let's go back to the courtroom a little bit because I want to read you something, you all something that the Wall Street Journal said about this book. It says, matters culminate in a courtroom fireworks display worthy of Perry Mason in its prime. The murder rule holds one's holds one's interest from its cheeky opening pages through its final scene. That courtroom scene was unbelievably propulsive, so much fun, so visual, so cinematic. Were you just typing like crazy as you wrote it? Where did that come from and what was that like? 
Oh, I was. I, and I was taking some liberties because I desperately wanted Hannah to be running the show at that point. And, you know, she's a law student. You know, what are the chances of her actually being able to do that are pretty slim. But I, man, you know, I did find that there was this rule that, that law students who were in good standing in, in the state could be heard by the court. So it is possible. Maybe I'm threading that needle a little thinly. Um, but it was really important to me that some of the confrontations that happen in the courtroom um, are allowed to happen in that way. And it was important to me that Hannah, without giving anything away, is given an opportunity to redeem herself. Um, so it was fun to write that. And of course, all those great courtroom scenes I've read over the years uh, um, were in my mind, you know, and, and it was it was a, a nice thing to get an opportunity to do that. In Compulsion and in To Kill a Mockingbird and in 12 Angry Men, all, all those absolutely, all those absolutely amazing books. And it is so true to her personality because she starts out, as the Wall Street Journal says, she starts out cheeky. And then that, and then that courtroom scene, you know, mm -hmm. she's cheeky too. She's going to take a risk. She's going to do whatever it, it, she needs to do in that, in that case for the good. And that's the, you know, let me just get to this is that you as an author are so skilled because reading, reading the murder rule, you dole out. I mean, your readers, look at all the people in the comments, um, Gail <laughs> saying, love Perry Mason. We do too. Um, you dole out these little clues. Your readers are smart. And we're all thinking, oh, I figured that out. Oh, I know. I know where this is going. Oh, she's so tricky. I, but she can't fool me. I'm so smart. And so we're reading along really fast saying, I got this. I got this. And then just you do not. I, readers, let me tell you, you do not. You do not. No matter how smart you think you are, you will not figure this out. Talk a little bit about how you evolved that marvelous twisty, fair, but slight <laughs> hand in your novel. Oh, first of all, thank you, Hank. That's so incredibly generous. Um, I guess it's a, com it's a combination of two things. I think one of them is, you know, genuinely working on the plotting in advance and, and working out the nuts and bolts of the story to some degree before I start writing. But the other thing that is so important to me is um, working on characters from the beginning. I don't want to write a book unless I'm either in love with the character or I hate them. But either way, I've got to feel something really strongly about them because I know it's that emotion that will drive me through the writing of the story when it's 18 months in and you know I've worked this thing so hard. If I don't feel something for it, it's, I'm not going to be able to work in it in the same way. So I've got to do that. So by the time I'm writing the book, I really do know the characters pretty well and I feel very strongly about them. And the lovely thing about that is it's like placing actors on the stage, you know, sometimes they surprise you. Sometimes some chemistry or something organic just grows from their interaction. And there was a moment in this story, um, which is the, the sort of twist, if you like, which happens in prison. I won't say anything more than that. That was that was organic and it just occurred to me in the writing of the story. I went, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> and I'm, 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 tears are coming to my eyes because, you know, I, I thought when I read that, I thought, what does that mean? Are you kidding me? How can that be? And I felt <laughs> like going back to the beginning of the book and starting over. Yeah. How you it, and there, you know, really you know what that feels like, Hank. I'm sure that moment where it just comes together, you know, so then I could go back. But then as a writer, you do get to go back and foreshadow that stuff and make it work so that it's seamless for the reader. I mean, we, we, we're we supposed to put in the work so that you guys don't have to. That's the deal. <laughs> but we still do. You know, we still try to figure it out. And so you you as the author always have to stay a couple of steps ahead yeah. of your readers. Darlene is saying, I love an unforeseen twist. There is not just one twist in this book. Just <laughs> give up, you all. Just go ahead and <laughs> lean back and read the, read the murder rule and have fun doing it. As we close and get ready to go to questions, um, Dervla, thank you for this. You're amazing. I could talk to you forever, even though it's now 3.30 in, in a.m. where you are. Um, your story of the moment you found out that your first book had sold is absolutely a showstopper. Can you tell us that? Well? Sure. Oh gosh, um, it was back in 2016 and I, well, it was really to do with getting an agent really, it was the, the, the very strange early moments. I, I actually, I had been writing the book for a while. I had um, this book that became The Ruin. I was a bit unsure about whether or not it was ready. So I'd really only sent it off to one agent. 
Um, and then it was July 2016. I'll never forget the morning. It was 8 a.m. on a Friday morning. And my family and I were due to head down south to go away with friends for the weekend. But I had a GP appointment. Um, I'd been having headaches for a while. And my husband had eventually insisted that I go see a doctor. So I had been to see the doctor. I'd had some tests. And then I was going in to pick up the results, thinking that it was going to be nothing. Um, and I'll never forget the moment I went into the GP office and I could kind of see the GP was nervous and she just said, just to me straight, she said, Darvely, you have a brain tumor. And have you noticed that you've lost your eyesight yet? And I was like, no. And she said, well, look, it's quite a large brain tumor and it's in a very difficult area and it's likely to, you're likely to lose your peripheral vision. She, she, she went on and she made it very clear that in the absence of surgery, um, it would ultimately be fatal. So she turned to her her bookshelf and she took down her desk reference and she scanned through it until she found neurosurgeons and she wrote the names of three neurosurgeons in purse on a yellow post-it note and she gave it to me and she said, now, whichever one of these doctors will see you first is who you need to see. So I said, okay, and I asked a few more questions and but it went by very quickly. And I think probably about five minutes after I entered the room, I was back out in the car in um, the car park with this little yellow post-it note and all I was thinking is if I go home and start making these phone calls at home, the kids are going to come running. I think Freya was six and Oshim was only four at the time. You know, it's children of that age, as soon as you get on the phone, they're right there with you. So I thought, no, I, I, I better do this here. And I think I was still in denial because I wasn't devastated. I was just looking up the names of these or the telephone numbers of these guys on the web and, and making phone calls. And as I was doing that, my phone buzzed with an email from this agent in New York who had read my 50 pages that I'd sent her. And she was just saying that she loved them. And could I send her the full manuscript? Now, I've been writing for a while and I, I knew from online forums and everything else that that didn't happen, you know, that that never happens, that you just, you know, you write for years and you write another manuscript and another manuscript and eventually maybe you get a beginning. But this was a very unexpected. So. I went home to my husband and I took him upstairs and I took him into our room and I closed the door and I took him into our dressing room, closed the door and I said, okay, I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? And he was like, well, okay, let's go with the bad news. And I said, well, it, it's actually a brain tumor. But there's a literary agent. <laughs> it's just, I, I think I was in a little bit in denial. And for me, these both of these things were so huge. So I ended up having three weeks between that diagnosis and my surgery. And it was a crazy time because the first surgeon we saw said it was inoperable um, and it was the second surgeon then who was able to give us hope. And then, you know, there was a lot happening. Um, but I spent most of my time sending the book to agents, and which seems ridiculous because, you know, you're dealing with this massive thing. But um, I think I just wanted to know or wanted the world to know because I didn't know if I was going to come out the other end of the surgery that maybe it could have happened that there was a chance for me if things had been different or something or maybe i just needed the hope of it all but by the time i, I had the surgery afterwards you know it took it was 11 days in hospital and about 10 weeks recuperating at home um by about week seven uh, the book went out on submission on a friday on a on the tuesday we had a preemptive offer for the book and by that friday we had six offers for the book and it ended up going to auction so before I'd even gone back to work, the book had sold. It was just a very crazy time, a weird and crazy time, weird and wonderful. You know, you must be so, your view of the world and how things happen must have been so altered by that. Mm -hmm. It was, I think I, I think any writer who has sudden success finds it very, it turns your world upside down you know for me it happened at a time when my world was already completely confusing and i think everything felt surreal for about two years i just couldn't process what was happening you know i got to go to sydney and melbourne and meet editors who wanted to publish the book and listen to them talk you know with excitement about it and i couldn't speak i mean they must have thought i was so inarticulate i, I couldn't speak because this didn't make any sense to me and i just couldn't begin to make sense of what was happening and even when the book was published which was a good year or so later 
Um, I remember I got to go to Adelaide Writers Festival and Louise Penny was there and the organizers put me on Louise, Louise's, like I got to sit up beside Louise on the stage and there were 400 people in the audience, obviously to see Louise, but she was so generous and gorgeous and kind. And again, it was one of those moments where I just, none of it made sense. None of it made sense to me. And it still doesn't in many ways, but it did change me because it made me realize that there's tomorrow is never guaranteed. I know that's such a cliche, but when you understand that at a really personal level and you know that we are all going to die, which we know already, but you're not promised any extra days, you know, you get what you get. Um, it does change how you think about the world, I think, and how you think about life for sure. Well, we are so honored to have you be here today, Dervla. I mean, we are so grateful that you, I mean, look at everybody, people, the, you, the thoughts and hugs and accolades are pouring oh, in. Guys. I hope when you wake up in the morning, morning again, you'll look at these and understand how much we love you and how much, how this book is fantastic and how you are so right. You never know what's around the next corner, mm -hmm. but in this case, it was the beginning of a wonderful thing. And we are so grateful that you, you know, we're, you're a phoenix from the ashes and we are all, we are all the better for it. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Whatever time this is, in the middle of the night, <laughs> awake, I saw you with the dog behind you get up and sort of pass. She's out. shuffled forward, but thankfully she's she's behaved herself. So that was nice. close. <laughs> she knows your fans are here. Dina, Dion is saying, what a great story. And you should, have you thought about writing your own story? She just told us it is inspirational, Gail says. Hugs to you um, and love to you. And that is from all of us here Thanks, at the Mighty Place. Let me quickly say, you all do not move because Durval was here in a special edition of Crime Time. And our regular edition starts at 4 o'clock. And look who we have. You all a completely different kind of book. We have a, oops, did my computer just go down? Something just happened. All right. Can you still see me? We still got you. to the light. Uh, yeah, hello, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll say this really, really fast. This, we're having Zach Bissonette with The Killing in Costumes, a really funny Hollywood cozy that you don't want to miss. I told you, Dervil, at the beginning of this event that uh, my computer was absolutely going crazy, and this is a first, but we shall see. All of you, love you, love you, love you. See you at four o'clock. I'm sure my computer will be back. Um, and just remember, it is always safe inside a book. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Dervla. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Oh, we forgot to give away the book. We forgot to give away the book. Oh, we're still on. Bozy. Bozy in the back room. We forgot to give away the book. And we forgot to do the questions because my computer is not working. I'm going to see if I can make it happen. It is worth it to give it away. Can we take a couple questions, Dervla? Do you have time? Of course. Yes, of course. I'm so, I was so flummoxed by how there's suddenly no light in this room. <laughs> um, my camera is on. All right. Let's take a couple of questions. Can we do it, Bozy? We can do this in the, the ghost version. Do we have any questions? We, I saw them as we came in and let's see. Let me see. I'll go back through it and see. Um, uh, I know we had lots of questions earlier on. There we go. How has Dervla's legal career influenced her writing? Does it, I mean, it is a different kind of storytelling. Mm, totally different. And I mean, look, I was, as I said, I was really a transactional lawyer, you know? I mean, I, I just wrote and negotiated these giant contracts. I think it helped me a few different ways. I guess as a young lawyer, you're friends with other young lawyers who are doing very different, taking different career paths. So I did have some friends who are criminal defense lawyers and I heard from them about their direct experience. And you get a little bit of an insight into what's happening in the back room and what really makes cases. So that that helped me. And then the other one was very practical. You know, when you have to negotiate a 600 page contract with multiple appendices, your brain changes, you know, the way you think and, 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 and remember things. I always think of the London cabbies who do the knowledge. Have you guys heard of this? So London cab drivers have to do something called the knowledge, which is this test so that, to make sure that they actually understand how London is laid out and that they can make their way around. And they've done uh, scans of the brains of London cab drivers, and they've shown much more activity in certain parts of their brain, their memory, how they build memory maps is different, which is really fascinating, I think. But I always think that it's a little bit similar when you're negotiating these massive contracts. You have to know that if you change clause 1A3 part D, it impacts 43C and 55D and 25 thing, and the whole web shifts slightly. 
and then it moves again and you have to really be able to hold all that in your head i think it helps with plotting novels that you can map something and hold all these different parts i so agree it's so interesting because you are having you have a hundred thousand words in your head Mm -hmm. And if someone else changed one of those words, you would know what it was. But I remember yeah. in my in the book that I'm working on right now, um, really, really quickly, um, I had someone have a worry that there was a bug in her car. And then she was worried about it, worried about it, worried about it. Then when she then she went home and she never thought about it again. <laughs> so I thought, oh my golly, luckily I was in the, you know, in the in the in the in the edits. So she never thought about it again. So I thought, oh my gosh, she's forgotten about the bug. What am I going to do? She drives to the Cape in the same car with friends without even thinking about the bug. <laughs> so I thought, oh, oh my golly, what am I, this is horrible, a career ending error. So I thought, okay, I'll just have her take her other car. <laughs> other car. So I had to give her another car. So, but that the other car didn't have the same things in the glove compartment that the first car did. And she had yeah. a two car garage. Because she, yeah. at, one, at one scene in the book, she says, my husband isn't home, so his half of the gar garage is empty. Now it had to be his third of the garage is empty because there needed to so be there two cars. cars. <laughs> Those three cars. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And it, yeah. I never thought about it that way. But the, dump, yeah. the threads that you have to pull in yeah. the law, yeah. you, if you use an ampersand instead of the word and, you're doomed. Yes, you know? yes, exactly. Where a comma lies can change the interpretation of an entire contract so that the tiny nuance and the understanding that pull this thread and now you have to look at all of this um, is relevant to our writing i think great question gail let's take one more so i can see if i can fix the light on my computer did you spend time in maine yeah bar harbor why did you I have the seven oh gosh renee i did when i was uh, 22 i was a, a law student i was just finishing up and um, before i went so we do four years in ireland doing our primary degree and then we go to law school so in that gap i went to america and i had on a j what's called a j1 visa which is a real tradition with irish students we get a j1 visa which allows us to go and work for the summer in the states and you know it's a real rite of passage for us but i spent my summer in maine working in a very expensive B&B &B as a chambermaid. And I was in this little little room, like you could just imagine it, like a little mouse's room in the basement and sneak up and do the rooms in the morning and waitressing at night. And I was sharing this little room with my friend and my very good friend. And it was a fabulous, really wonderful time. But because I had lived, I lived in my parents' house during university, this was really my first time living away properly. Um, and it was, exciting and a little bit scary and i had the support you know if i needed to go home i could go home but a lot of the people i was working with in the kitchens and in the restaurant you know they were supporting themselves and you could see how fragile that balance of life was for everybody and how easily it could tip one way or the other so that always stayed with me and i had some still some fabulous memories of maine and i i can't wait to go back I'm going to Vermont in October for the next book for research. Oh, wow. So I have more time I hop over. In Boston. Come visit in Boston or do an event. Oh, my God, I'd love to. I, it's the shortest trip, Hank, if you knew it. I've got four four planes to get 39 hours to get from Perth to Vermont. And I have four or five days to research and then straight back because obviously being away from the kids is tricky. But um, it's, it's a crazy journey and very tight, unfortunately. All right. All right. But next time. And if you need next a time, for stay, sure. that would be great. I want to tell you all that I just figured out what happened was that I put Dervla's book on my computer on the key that darkens the screen. <laughs> and it's Dervla that's awake at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> It'd be totally fine. But I thought, why would that happen? And now I just made it brighter. And there you have it. I'm back. You all. It all. Let's take one more question. What was the, oh, Anissa, welcome, sweetheart. Who was the hardest character to write in this book and why? Oh, it was definitely Laura. Um, Laura was the hardest character to write um, because I didn't know if I, this is the honest truth, I couldn't commit to who she was. I was so torn about whether I wanted her to be at core a good person or not. And I think I wanted her to be everything, which is not possible. At the end of the day, I had to make a commitment to who she really was at her, at her core. And so until I really accepted who she was, I'm not going to tell you which she is. Um, I was make I, I couldn't write her, and I wrote the, all those chapters that I mentioned to you guys earlier. Then I had the the diary idea, and I also had to accept that she was going to be this person. And then she started to flow for me properly. But she was she was by far the hardest, and she was so important to get right. So it was tricky. Yeah, 
and that proves you got her right when she when it started to work. I hope so. Yeah, for me, I hope for me she works. But I guess everybody has to decide that for themselves. That I can't say it. I can't say it enough, you all. The Murder Rule by Dirk McTiernan. We will get her to Boston, and we will get you back on Crime Time on your next book. I would love that. Are you working on a new book? Yes, it's pretty close to. I'm pretty close to finishing the first draft. I've just done my read through after getting to the end and I was pleasantly surprised at how much I'm going to get to keep with this one. Usually I have to call most of it in the second draft, but a lot of it I will, I mean, it'll all be rewritten every word probably, but in terms of how the story's unfolding, where the chapters are sitting, most of it is going to say, stay, which is really, really nice news for me. <laughs> Well, remind me when I can go to my mailbox to get my copy. I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Oh, you. thank you, Anka. Let's really. Give away, let's give away a copy of um, William Morrow and Dirk. We're giving away a copy of the Murder Rule very, very quickly. Let's spin the wheel of fun. Look at all of these comments. People are saying, <laughs> says, love this. This, thank you. Now, let's spin the wheel of fun and see who wins a copy of the Murder List. Come on, wheel of fun. I know we can do this. <laughs> There we go. I want to see this. I've, you know, I've, I've heard. Oh my God, that's so cool! Isn't that so funny? It shows it's it's absolutely fair. Love it. And the winner is Jan Janice Crombie Cross. Welcome. I think you're new to Crime Time. I, if you are, that's marvelous. If you're not, welcome, welcome, welcome. Email me, as it says. It, you will have a banner that says what you should do. Email me, and we will contact her, and we will get you a copy of the book. You lucky woman, that is so great. The rest of you hop right out right now to your favorite bookstore and get a copy of The Murder Rule. Come back in, woo, 10 minutes for Zach Bissonette. He's adorable, he's charming, a wonderful, cozy, a killing in costume, costumes about Highwood memorabilia. You will love this. Uh, if you love Jessica Fletcher and Agatha Christie, this is the book for you. And we will see you in seven minutes. We will see you next week, Dervla. Night, night. <laughs> night, night, guys. Thank you so much, Hank. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. It's lovely to see you all. Our pleasure. See you next time, you all.